church building to meet in, God meets in the people who are the temple of the living God. This is uh, Transfiguration Sunday, where we celebrate the last Sunday before we enter the Lenten season that takes us all the way to Holy Week and the cross of Jesus. Jesus had an amazing transformation, a transfiguration of his whole countenance as he was in prayer. We'll be talking about that today in the sermon. And God wants to speak to us and lift us up and give us a glimpse of glory today. So join me, if you will, for our call to worship. Sometimes we do not know what to say. For, for we, we are, are afraid. afraid. But a cloud overshadows us. And, and a, a voice, voice comes, comes to us. us. This is my son, the beloved. Listen to him. Lord, Lord we, we listen, listen today. today. Yes, let's listen to the Lord today, and as we do so, let's open our hearts and minds by singing, Here I Am to Worship.
us off offer prayers to the Holy One, whose glory is a devouring fire and a mighty tempest. For your church throughout the world, sharing the death and the resurrection of Christ. Lord, Lord have, have mercy. mercy. <clears throat> for John Scholl, our bishop, for Hector Burgos, our district superintendent, for all pastors and deacons, and all who minister in Christ, and for all the people of God. Lord, Lord have, have mercy. For all the nations and peoples of the earth, and for justice, mercy, and peace. Lord, Lord have, have mercy. mercy. For all who are needy, desolate, forgotten, suffering, lonely, and disconsolate. Lord, Lord have, have mercy. mercy. For those suffering from the coronavirus, and for those who mourn lost loved ones. Lord, Lord have, have mercy. Blessed are you, God of et light eternal. Hear our prayers for all people, <clears throat> and let your glory shine upon us, that our lives may proclaim your goodness, and our works give you honor. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Now, now let us pray for the world and those dear to our hearts. We pray for Lord, in your mercy, hear, hear our, our prayer. prayer. Now let us pray the prayer that Jesus taught us Say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
The only way that the church keeps going is because God's people are faithful in their stewardship as to what they take of their own substance that God has blessed them with and offers it to God. Now God has set up that kind of system to where God blesses us so that we would be a blessing to other people. There's many ways to give to the church. You can send it in the mail to 36 East Broad Street if you're supporting the Broad Street United Methodist Church. You can take it and drop it through the mail slot at the front door of the church, or you can give electronically. But I want to say to Christians that are in any church that you are supporting, support that church, and especially during a time of the COVID virus where so many churches are struggling uh, to, to make ends meet. Be faithful in your stewardship. Let's join our hearts together, and I will pray for our stewardship. Holy One, we seek your wisdom and guidance. Many people face growing economic uncertainty. Many experience realities like job loss, and deflated investment accounts, and increased grocery prices, and mounting debt. Save us from overwhelming fear and anger. Free us from the bondage of money. We give of our resources as a gesture of our trust in you, despite challenging financial times. We, get out, we give out of love and gratitude for your kingdom's sake. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We serve a wonderful God, one that is filled with majesty and glory. Let's sing to the glory of the Lord, majesty, worship his majesty. Jesus would soon head toward Jerusalem, where he would face the cross. He had already begun preparing the disciples for this ordeal. He predicted that his encounter with the Jerusalem religious officials would end in rejection and crucifixion. They could not grasp his meaning. To fortify their weak faith, and pre that prepare them for the shattering experience, Jesus gave them a glimpse 
a preview of glory. Let us enter the dynamics of this story from Mark, chapter 9. Six days later, Jesus took Peter, James, and John and brought them to the top of a very high mountain where they were alone. He was transformed in front of them, and his clothes were amazingly bright, brighter than if they had been bleached white. Elijah and Moses appeared and were talking with Jesus. Peter reacted to all of this by saying to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good that we are here. Let us make three shrines, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. He said this because he didn't know how to respond, for the three of them were terrified. Then a cloud overshadowed them, and a voice spoke from the cloud. This is my son, whom I dearly love. Listen to him. Suddenly, looking around, they no longer saw anyone with them except Jesus. As they were coming down the mountain, he ordered them not to tell anyone what they had seen until after the human one had risen from the dead. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
movies. I watch a lot of movies. I'm a, a movie buff. And when we could go before the COVID hit and so many of the theaters were shuttered, uh, one thing I insisted upon when Steph and I were going out for a movie night is that I would get there early because I wanted to see all of the trailers. She'd say, oh, we got, you know, 20 more minutes or so. But no, I want to get the popcorn. I want to get whatever you get. I want to get set down. And I watch every one of those trailers. We need previews. We need trailers. Uh, because in those, I would catch a little glimpse of some of the movies that were there and uh, that were going to come up in the next few weeks. And I wanted to see, sample them all and just see what it was like. I like to go to Costco, too. And before the COVID hit, they always had samples in some of the aisles. And I would just go from one place, one site to another. Uh, and I've even purchased some of the items that they were, they were putting on the sample shelves because some lady with her hairnet and uh, with latex gloves invited me to try some kind of morsel of delicacy. And I liked that, what I sampled. And, and so I bought the pack. Trailers give us a glimpse of what's to come. Samples help us have a small taste of something that is in store for us if you just purchased the product and took it home. Don't you, don't you like to have see a little bit ahead and get a glimpse of something that's coming? Don't we need some preparation, some orientation and preview? As thinking about when you go to the hospital for a, for a surgery or for some procedure, you want someone to sit down there and tell you just a little bit about what's going to happen, what can you expect, and give you some assurances that it's going to be okay. Now, we know that human assurances are nothing certain about those, but um, still, we want to have someone to tell us this is what exactly is what's going to happen. When a college student goes off to university, is matriculating for the first time in a new school, often the university provides a walkthrough, a visit to the dorm, the classrooms, administrative building, the library, uh, the sports complex, to help the incoming student feel comfortable and at home when they actually come. Well, today we have something like that because on Transfiguration Sunday, it's a mountaintop view a preview, a trailer of good things to come. Transfiguration Sunday. It seems important within the Bible, at least, because this story that we read about Jesus on the mountaintop appears in Mark's Gospel, it appears in Matthew's Gospel, and it appears in Luke's Gospel. It's not mentioned in John, but the writer of 2 Peter also mentions this event about hearing the voice of God on the holy mountain. Now, let's look at the elements of this story. What do we have here? Well, it takes place on a mountaintop. Ascending a mountaintop to have a divine encounter, that occurs a lots of times in the Bible. Mountaintops were places of revelation, a place of meeting God. Think of the stories, the different stories in the Bible, if you learned them in Sunday school, Mount Moriah, where Abraham took Isaac in an act of sacrifice and dedication to God, and God provided the sacrifice there for Abraham. Moses received the Ten Commandments on Mount Sinai. It was on a mountain that Elijah held a contest, Mount Carmel, between the prophets of Baal and the god Yahweh. And then Elijah later returned to Mount Sinai, which was also called Mount Horeb. And he was there in a cave, suffering from deep depression when he met God again on the mountain in a still, small voice. We come to the New Testament in Matthew's Gospel. Jesus went up the side of a mountain. He sat down. And there he delivered his kingdom message that we know as the Sermon on the Mount. After Jesus' resurrection, later in the story than what we read today, the disciples went to a mountain in Galilee where Jesus uttered his final words and sent them out into the world to make disciples of all nations. But here, right in the middle of Mark's Gospel, is another account of a mountaintop. Jesus takes his three closest friends, Peter, James, and John, and they ascended on a mountain to pray. Jesus often went off alone or took a few with him and would go off by himself to pray and recharge his spiritual batteries. As Jesus communed with God, Jesus began to 
glow with this unearthly light. It said in the Gospel of Mark, his clothes were amazingly bright, brighter than if they had been bleached in white. For those moments, God's glory shone through the man Jesus as light streams through a stained glass window on a bright Sunday morning. We speak of the glory of God, but when we say glory, glory be to God, glory to God, to Him belong all the glory and honor and praise. What is glory? We use these words like glory, holy, majesty. We lift up the name. We use those kind of words to try to express something that's really beyond human words to adequately express. Glory implies light. Glory, in fact, is the effect of concentrated light. It's as though God says in this event of Jesus just glowing and bursting with light, just drenched in light, Jesus is the light of the world. Jesus illuminates the true estate of the world and of our own hearts so that in His light we can see light. Jesus, standing there before Peter and James and John, was suddenly transfigured and was glowing. This was their preview. This was their sample, their trailer of good things to come. The trailer of divine glory. Glory speaks of manifest excellence. That glow of God that's sort of inexpressible because even though it's there, often we don't see it as light. It's in the very countenance of goodness and beauty and truth. When Moses ascended the mountain, Mount Sinai, and stood in the presence of God, it said his face was all aglow with God's radiance so that when he came down, he had to cover his face with a veil. It was so bright. The elder John wrote near the end of the New Testament, God is light, and in, in him is no darkness at all. But something else very strange, very eerie occurred right then. <laughs> Dead people appeared. People long since having passed from this earth. Two figures from the Old Testament appeared with Jesus. And there stands Peter, James, and John in astonishment as before them they saw Moses and Elijah. Now, it's interesting to me that we received no explanation of how the disciples knew who these two ancient worthies were. They had never seen a photograph since there was no photography at the time, and no one painted portraits of these people. I wish Mark could have given us just a little bit more information, don't you? But somehow the disciples instinctively knew who these two were, Moses and Elijah, both characters in our Old Testament deeply in the mindset of the Hebrew Bible and of the Jewish people. And why these two? Well, Moses, I believe, was there, bigger than life itself, because he was the quintessential, quintessential representative of the law, the Torah, the instruction. It was Moses that led the children of Israel out of Egypt, that gave them the covenant code that we know as the Ten Commandments and wrote the law and set up the tent of worship for them. There he stood, bigger than life and full of color, conversing with Jesus. And who was the other figure? Elijah was there. Why this man? This was a ninth century prophet. He never wrote anything in his life that we know of, but he was a ninth century prophet that stood as Israel in Israel's estimation as the prototypical prophet the great prophet that would speak and challenge the kings and challenge the princes and challenge the rich in the way that they were not keeping covenant, not showing love and justice within their world. In fact, in the Jewish tradition, Elijah was expected to arrive before the Messiah arrived. Several times in the Gospels, the disciples asked Jesus, why did the Pharisees, why did the rabbis and the teachers of the law say Elijah must come first? In fact, in our book of Malachi, which is the last book in the Protestant Old Testament, right those final verses of the Old Testament predicted, I will send to you Elijah the prophet before the great and terrible day of the Lord. He'll turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the children to the wisdom of the just. Jesus did not accept the fact that a literal Elijah was coming back, but he did say, 
if you look at John, you'll see everything that Elijah was supposed to have done. Now these two men, Moses and Elijah, represented the whole of the Old Testament faith, the law and the prophets. Whenever they spoke about their holy books, they spoke of the law and the prophets, and sometimes a third category was the writings. But often the law and the prophets stood for everything that had come on before that set the scene of creation and fall and promise of redemption and the prophets and the justice. Mark cuts the story short and says simply that these two men were talking with Jesus. He has a very tame way of telling the story, but Luke explains what they were discussing. It says they saw Moses and Elijah discussing with Jesus about the, in the Greek, the exodus that he was about to accomplish in Jerusalem. Of course, they're referring to his death, his resurrection, and his ascension, a great exodus out of a world of alienation from, from God to a world of relationship with God. The law and the prophets summed up the Old Testament, the Hebrew Scriptures. These two represented, Moses and Elijah, represented the whole of the Abrahamic faith, finding its completion and its fulfillment in the Christ. The law and the prophets point to Jesus as promise waiting for fulfillment, and Jesus comes as the fulfillment. Now, this was a strange scene. Jesus is praying, his clothes begin to glow, he begins to exude an unearthly light, and then Moses and Elijah appear and are talking about that he's going to Jerusalem to accomplish an exodus. And Peter was beside himself. He was overwhelmed. This mystical experience, this seeing, this glowing unearthly light and a radiance streaming from Jesus and beholding the saints of the Old Testament conversing with Christ, all of them were terrified, Peter, James, and John, at this awesome display of glory. And he wanted to make a religion out of it. He blurts out, Rabbi, Rabbi, it's good that we're here. It's good that we're here. Let's make... Let's make three shrines, one for you, one for Moses, one for Elijah. He said that he didn't know what he was talking about because he was so frightened. That's what we often do, though. We take an experience and we try to codify it. We try to domesticate it. We try to build a shrine. We try, try to turn it into a controlled experience that we can repeat again and again. It's always available for us to return to. Some spiritual experiences just can't be contained and explained. I was thinking about something that happened in the charismatic movement. I, I grew up in that, the Pentecostal church. And in Toronto, uh, so many years ago, there was this a phenomenon that happened while people were in the church praising the Lord. And suddenly they broke out into laughter. It became known as just sort of the laughter experience. And people began to make pilgrimages to Toronto so they could go and see Christians laughing as a part of their worship. And it spread to some other parts. It's like, okay, we haven't really got the presence of God unless we reduplicate what had happened in Toronto, the Toronto experience of laughing and laughing. Well, some experiences are not to be codified. We don't have to build shrines to everything that's happened that's good in the past. I don't blame Peter. I think he meant well. He wanted to honor the moment. He wanted to preserve the experience. This was an amazing thing. He didn't know where he was going with this. He wanted to keep it going to turn it into a tradition that you could celebrate. But sometimes an experience is unique and unrepeatable. And in this case, this was just a glimpse of glory. We don't need a shrine to Moses. We don't need a shrine to the mosaic, to a mosaic cult or a mosaic cult to Develop. We don't need a memorial to Elijah so that devotees of Elijah can organize themselves and meet regularly and go back and relive those experiences. These men were great, but they should not be memorialized for people to venerate them. Now, Peter, Jesus, Jesus spoke no words of rebuke to Peter. He didn't criticize. He didn't say, that's a stupid idea. But the next movement of this story really, really got to me. It said suddenly a cloud enveloped them. God's ways are often hidden ways. That sort of cloud of mystery, that cloud of unknowing, that cloud that we don't see everything clearly. When God comes on the scene, it is a divine mystery because we can never penetrate to really see God 
clearly. In fact, John's gospel put it this way. No one has ever seen God. But the only begotten Son, in the bosom of the Father, He has made Him known. And we have all seen His glory. And He's full of grace and truth. God is enshrouded in light and clouds. Like in the ascension. On that Mount of Ascension that we read about near the end of Luke's Gospel, a cloud hid Jesus in the beginning of Acts 2. A cloud hid Jesus from their eyes as Jesus ascended. You could not really see how it happened. Remember in the Old Testament, the pillar of cloud that descended on Mount Sinai and God spoke out of a cloud, a cloud of glory that filled the temple. In fact, in the days of Solomon, filled the Holy of Holies when Solomon had just dedicated the temple. A cloud of glory filled the temple and said the priests could not even continue their ministry because of that cloud and the glory that was there. A cloud in the Bible depicts the very presence of God who cannot be seen and cannot be grasped. A cloud covered Jesus, covered Moses, covered Elijah. And three disciples stood there shaking in their boots. But then the next part of the story as God had spoken to Moses out of a cloud, God spoke to these disciples out of a cloud. A cloud of glory. And what did God say? This is my son, whom I dearly love. Listen to him. It's very similar to what Mark reports that had happened right at the beginning of Jesus' ministry. Remember at his baptism, when John the Baptist said, Elijah, who was to come... Uh, was baptizing Jesus, the heavens opened up, a dove descended, and a voice came, This is my Son, my dearly beloved Son. God claims Jesus as the dear, dearly beloved Son, the one standing in immediate relationship to God. This is the confession that begins the very Gospel of Mark. The very first sentence says, The beginning of the good news of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. This is what even demonic spirits would cry out, what do you want to do with us, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? Chapter 5. This confession was on the lips of the Roman centurion at the very foot of the cross at the crucifixion when he saw Jesus as the temple veil ripped apart and an earthquake hit the land in darkness. He said, surely this was the Son of God. And it's God's pronouncement on Jesus. This is my Son whom I dearly love. Listen to him. Well, we do well to listen to Jesus. God said we ought to, to shape our lives around Him. In listening to Him, we observe His example. We treasure His teachings. We put what we know into action. We view God's character and purposes shining through the lens of Jesus, just as that cloud suddenly had enshrouded them all in that mystical experience. Suddenly, the mist dissipated. Moses and Elijah vanished into clear air. And what did they see standing there? Only Jesus. Jesus alone. The unearthly light faded away, and there stood a lone man, Jesus, strengthened and fortified to face the trials of the cross. Only Jesus. That's the one that we see and that we should listen to. We see him, we see his love and his humility. We behold his drive to reconcile all people, to heal. His willingness to eat with sinners, to be with the outcasts and share fellowship with the socially excluded. We see his tenderness as he takes little infants in his arms and he blesses them. We see his compassion, the very compassion of God, streaming through him in looking at Jesus. We're able to see a hidden glory. For a moment, they saw the manifest glory. But then we, for, for, for all days, we see that hidden glory, that veiled glow of God. And in seeing Jesus, the one to whom the law and the prophets point, we are changed. This is my son. Listen to him. And we are transformed as we do so from ecocentric people to Christocentric people. Paul put it this way. In the Second Corinthians, the letter to the Corinthians, he said, All of us are looking with unveiled faces at the glory of the Lord as if we were looking in a mirror. 
we are being we are being transformed into that same image from one degree of glory to another degree of glory and this comes from the Lord who is the Spirit the glory of God comes right through the face of Jesus and as we gaze on it as we look on it in faith we are being changed Jesus gives us a glimpse a trailer a preview of glory that far exceeds any of our expectations in following Jesus God reveals God's glory in us. Paul wrote even of our present sufferings, which we're not excluded from any of the sufferings and difficulties of people around us, but this is how he looked at it. He, he wrote in Romans chapter 8, I believe that the present suffering is nothing compared to the coming glory that is going to be revealed to us. We only have a hint. We only have a small sample. We only have a tiny trailer and a preview. And Paul wrote again in the book of Colossians, God wanted to make the glorious riches of his secret plan known among the Gentiles, which is Christ living in you, is the hope of glory. You have that hope of glory today. I hope you do. I hope that you know that this life is in all the events. And that the glory of God, the love of God, the manifest excellence of God, that glow of God can be yours now and even greater in the world to come. Jesus is reigning now and will always reign. Let's close our service with joy in our hearts today by singing, Jesus shall reign. In the coming week, may you experience the presence of God with joy. May the holy cloud comfort you. May the divine voice encourage you. And may the power of the Spirit transform you. Transform, transform us. Transform, transform our world. Amen.